Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the third of this year's Robbins Lectures, de delivered by, as you know, Paul Krugman. Now, some time back, the organizers of this series asked me to chair the third of these lectures, and I readily agreed. What I didn't know at that time was, unfortunately, I was going to be out of the country the first two evenings, so I've only made it back here. But I have been following avidly the podcasts and the video links online, and, which is a good thing, because on my long journey back, every time I got off the airplane and was at some airport, I would be getting text messages from all over the world, people thinking that I actually knew what was going on here, the LSE, asking me, well, what's Paul Krugman going to say this evening? What's he going to say next? How are markets going to be moving? I figured, well, this evening, finally, I actually get to be here. But of course, I get to be here having realized with some horror that this evening is about the implications of this entire mess for how we need to redo the teaching of economics and how we need to tell economists, macroeconomists in particular, the errors that they've been making. Now, the last couple of years, I've been lucky enough to be head of the department here in economics at the LSE. But I've only, but I've only done, so I've only done a little bit of the macroeconomics teaching that I normally do. When I heard that, I frantically went back to my notes looking for how many times I had said things that I shouldn't have. And I realized that the organizers of this evening's, of this series of lectures, did not ask me out of the goodness of their heart <laughs> to chair this evening's lecture. It was not because they thought that they would give me an evening's rest from having to mediate between my colleagues, all of whom wanted a bigger office for themselves, but that in my role as having taught macroeconomics, Instead of the very abstract discussion of offer curves that you've seen Paul do the last evening, that for his criticisms of economics teaching and macroeconomists in particular, here I am, a live punching bag. <laughs> Paul. Okay. <laughs> Wow. Um, so I need to correct uh, something I said uh, earlier. I think I said that really we're not seeing any um, adverse supply shocks in the global economy, but I believe a tube strike does qualify as a major adverse <laughs> supply. So, um, hi again. Uh, I am going to talk mostly tonight about uh, economics and, and the state thereof. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit beyond, uh, a little bit first just about the, the uh, future of, of the economy itself. Um, we will someday, somehow, um, get out of this, uh, out of this slump. Um, uh, it, it's, as I made clear, I think it's likely to be, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I think it's likely to be a prolonged, very difficult slog. Um, pr presumably, we will do something to try to avoid the flaws in our, our, our economic system that, that made this thing possible. And the most obvious thing, if you ask me, you know, what was it that caused the world economy once again to, uh, to experience something that at least has been dangerously reminiscent of the Great Depression, um, the answer surely would be the, the uh, financial, financial deregulation, uh, the way we accepted, cheered on uh, the financialization of the economy. Uh, and uh, just a couple of the charts, one, one from me, one from one that I'm, I'm stealing from other people. This is just a piece of what went on, but this is just for the United States. Look at, the, look at what happened to the uh, uh, the piece of the economy classified as securities, commodity contracts, and investments. Um, it was quite, it was, a, it was a trivial sector. It was really, you know, we, there, you, could, you could see stockbrokers in, in cartoons in the New Yorker maybe, but there really were very few people and not very much money uh, being made in this sector, and it just exploded. Came down a bit uh, with, the, uh, with the tech bust, but, but came back up, and you know, became this a very large industry. Just generally, we had a huge increase in the size of the finance sector. Measured broadly, 
it went from about 4% of GDP in the United States to about 8%. Uh, the f the, and the extra 4% was the fancy stuff. Uh, they, they, there, are, there are not a lot more bank branches uh, than there were. There's not a lot of the, the sort of ordinary stuff of finance. It's the, it's the high level um, and extremely high paying stuff uh, that took off. Um, you can see this. This is um, uh, Simon Johnson and, and James Kwok have been, they have a terrific blog, uh, Baseline Scenario, and they also, but this was from an article they published in The Atlantic. Um, they show financial industry profits. Um, and uh, actually, I would have, I would have um, made my own version of this chart, but the BEA website was down when I was trying to do that. Anyway, um, and uh, what's interesting actually is is that a, a lot of the increase in the share of GDP accruing from finance came not so much from an increase in the number of people, though there was some of that, as from the fact that the people started being paid so damn much. Uh, so you see that the average compensation per worker in finance was just about normal uh, up until the early 80s um, and then took off. This is not a case of all of the secretaries and clerks uh, making 80% more than their counterparts elsewhere in the economy. This is a few thousand people making incredible amounts of money. And uh, um, if we, it's not easy to tease out entirely, but it looks like a substantial part of the increase in income inequality in the United States and, and here, no doubt, particularly at the very top end, is in fact the extraordinary incomes being made by a few people in the financial industry. Um, if you look at when that happened, particularly if you look at the paper worker, there's a very clear break point. Uh, and it is uh, right in the, in the deregulation under Ronald Reagan. So it's pretty clear that, that something happened and we generated a much bigger financial sector, a financial sector that paid very big incomes to people, uh, doing a lot of exotic stuff. Uh, the claim was always that this was worth it because the financial, the new, uh, uh, more complex uh, financial system was doing good things. It was allocating capital to the place where it had the, the highest uh, social product. It was helping to spread risk so as to diminish the, the risk of, of catastrophes. Now, you know, as late as the very eve of the crisis, you can find, of course, speeches by, uh, by Alan Greenspan and others talking about what a wonderful thing these uh, new financial instruments are, that they help shift risk uh, so that, that we, are not, we don't have systemic risk anymore. Well, okay, that turned out entirely not to be true. Um, it's... Uh, the, I think I mentioned this before, but a lot of tremendous amount of singing of the praises of financial innovation. And now there's a kind of a game, which is try to you know, na name a financial innovation of the last couple of decades that is, uh, um, that is un unambiguously a good thing. Uh, and ATMs don't count. Uh, and, uh, and that's been, it's, it's actually, it's really, really hard. Uh, the, uh, um, I reread Ben Bernanke gave a speech a few weeks ago on financial innovation, and it he didn't actually he didn't actually try to meet the challenge. The three financial innovations he talked about were credit cards, uh, uh, overdraft protection, and finally subprime mortgages. And he didn't actually say that those were all good things. But the first two, which probably are good things, are sort of you know moral equivalent of ATMs, and uh, the last one obviously uh, came pretty close to blowing up the world. So it's, it's um, um, uh, hard, to, hard to make the case that this is, that, that this hypertrophied uh, financial system is actually something we want to have. Um, will it actually be curbed? I don't know. I, the, the, the buzz is that they will, and it looks like the, the sort of rearranging the boxes on the organization chart thing is not happening at the moment in the United States, but there is, a lot of talk particularly about trying to extend um, capital requirements to a much broader range of financial institutions, uh, basically try to reduce leverage, try to reduce exposure, prob more transparency, although everyone is always for more transparency and I don't know what it really means, but the, uh, um, probably we're looking towards a world with a lot less of this stuff going on. If that happens, um, it's, uh, probably a good thing from the point of view of society and the world, a little bit problematic for those who make their living at it. And uh, just 
one thought. Um, I, I, people may know, I'm actually short-term relatively optimistic about the UK. I actually think that, uh, among other things, your nice uh, beggar thy neighbor devaluation is, is going to be something that will help that no one else has managed. Uh, but um, uh, this is something I just put together. Um, exports of financial services. Um, the United States, uh, certainly New York, is enormously dependent on this uh, uh, on, on this world, this world of, of extremely high-paid people doing God knows what uh, in the financial sector, um, and it's it is if you looked at it as a as a regional economy that is a tremendous export industry, but it's primarily an export industry to North America, to the rest of the United States and uh, uh, the UK, uh, London as the financial capital of Europe, uh, exports of financial services is two and a half percent of GDP. Um, if that's, if we're going to have a much smaller financial sector, that could raise some interesting issues. The UK would have to have, find a very different economic structure along the line, along the way. Um, so, interesting to look at. Um, it's going to be a fight. I, I actually think that, that one of the things I expect to spend a lot of time doing over the next couple of years is, is trying to, to keep down efforts to reconstruct the financial system just the way it was in, in August 2007. Uh, we really do not want to go back there, and there, but there are a lot of people obviously who would like to do that, so we'll, we'll try to stop that. Okay, um, enough talk about reality. Let's talk about uh, the people who are supposed to study reality, um, to talk, talk about economists, uh, and of course, and, and economic theory in, 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 uh, in, in the face of, of this, this incredible crisis. So, all right, um, economists certainly are not doing very well in the public image right now. Uh, just uh, happened to find that one. Uh, so uh, this is uh, two economists in, in, the, uh, in the little boy's nightmare closet coming out and are doing what economists do and making confident claims that are in total opposition to one another. Actually, this is standard stuff. This happens all the time in, in uh, this is what people say about economists all the time, and part of the reason is that the economists that people uh, see are, are the talking heads on the financial channels, and, and uh, many of whom are, you know, w wouldn't, uh, would not be seen gracing these halls. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very different sort of thing. Um, but the fact of the matter is, this is, has been a trying time for, for economics. Um, economic analysis has been extremely useful in the crisis, has been extremely, uh, and, and certainly extremely influential. Uh, we certainly, we are pursuing very, very different policies from the policies that governments pursued in the, uh, in, in the early 1930s, um, I think to good effect. I actually think that, that we can say fairly confidently that the only reason we're not having uh, uh, if we're not, that we're not having a full replay of the Great Depression, is that, uh, that we have learned something since then and that governments are doing different things. If we had had the, the same monetary policies, the same fiscal policies that had been pursued, given that it turns out that our banking system um, is, because so much of it is not conventional depository institutions, has turned out to be every bit as vulnerable as the banking system of 1931. Uh, we could very easily have had the Great Depression all over again. We are pursuing better policies, which are based to a large extent on the insights of economists. The problem is almost all of the economic analysis that is of any use here is decades old, if not generations old. Um, it's very hard to avoid the impression that uh, pretty much that, that most of what we've done in macroeconomics uh, for the past 30 or so years has turned out to be spectacularly useless at best uh, and positively harmful uh, in, in some cases. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how that happened. Um, so what I'm going to do, I feel a little uneasy about this. I am not a proper intellectual historian. I'm not, I'm not going to do the spade work uh, to really figure out uh, uh, how it actually was. Uh, the, the, uh, what I'm going to give you is a, is a story, a parable, which is, I hope, uh, 
essentially right. And, and actually, I was there. To, you know, I've been, uh, I, I've been uh, either in grad school or working as a professional economist, and, and not, not in the middle of the macro debates, but, but paying close attention uh, from the mid-'70s on. And so I, ha I have some sense of how it played out, uh, which I think is, is may, may be useful. And I, I think there's, there's a story about what happened, which, which raises some deep questions about where we go from here. So, um, but go back to the beginning. Uh, and in the beginning is, is, is Keynes. Um, the, um, I went back, I wrote the, I wrote the introduction to the, uh, um, to, to the 70th anniversary reissue of the general theory, and actually, you know, went back and really reread Keynes, which I hadn't done for a long time. Um, and it's it's a it's it's an even more impressive book after you've got a few decades of your own efforts at economic research. Uh, um, it really uh, give you a, a story. I did. There was a point uh, some years ago when I did. Um, uh, working in the fields of geography, I was also paying attention to some development theory, and I wrote a little book, actually, a uh, um, series of lectures uh, called uh, Geography Development and Economic Theory, whose theme was that often before the formalizations, there was an informal uh, research agenda, informal literature, and that a lot was lost when the formalizations came. And so I looked at pre, um, pre. Uh, Sort of, there was a mathematization of economics that really began in the 30s. Keynes is part of that, um, and looked at what uh, ge economic geography was like before that. And there were a lot of insights that were lost and had to be regained several generations later. Um, I looked at development theories. There was a lot of stuff in development theory that that was kind of crowded out as people became more mathematical um, in the 50s and. Um, I thought, let's, I, there must be, there must have been an, an informative, uh, interesting, if not rigorous, business cycle tradition before Keynes and then Samuelson's formalizations of Keynes came along. Not so. If you try to read that pre-Keynesian business cycle theory, uh, it makes you want to bang your head on the table. It was complete lack of, of any insight. Um, um, what Keynes did was, uh, was to break through what was really an impenetrable uh, people had no way to think about the stuff. And, but what was it that Keynes did? It's crucially, um, he found a way to, to get past a, a, a great stumbling block, which was the belief that uh, income had to be spent, that, uh, that supply creates its own demand, what he called Say's Law. Um, the, uh, the, so this is, this is reading Keynes. This is from the uh, um, chapter two of the general theory. Um, that saying that basically, you know, money, if you, if you take money away from one thing, if people decide not to consume it, then, well, the money must go somewhere, so it has to be invested. Uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that's, there's a flow of income. The income always turns into spending. There's no way. There was no way in the view of, of economists before Keynes that, the, that there was any possibility of not having enough spending, not having enough demand to, uh, to make use of the economy's productive capacity. Um, we now, for those who teach economics, there's now something we, that's in every textbook, uh, Krugman Wells included, called the classical model uh, of the price level. It's not at all what the classicists actually said. It, the classical model is, is, is a post-Keynesian uh, view of what the, what the classical economists would have said if they had understood Keynes. Uh, it's not at all um, what they really thought. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the social advantages of private and national thrift, the uh, traditional attitude towards the rate of interest, classical theory of unemployment, the quantity theory of money. The, um, you can see that, that he's, he's saying that this, this view that, that's income has to be spent was at the core of, of a lot of things. And once you acknowledge that that might not be true, then things become very different. Um, sometimes people say that there's a, Keynes is one of those figures who's such an enormous, uh, you know, cast such a long shadow that people um, try to capture him for what, what they wanted, you know, what, what they would like economics to be about. 
And so there's, uh, um, you often see people say, well, you know, all this mathematics and economics, that's, you know, we need to go back to Keynes who wrote in words. And uh, um, it's actually, if, you, if you've picked that up, it's a little bit of a shock to, uh, to see uh, passages in Keynes that look like this. Uh, I'm not going to read it, right? Um, it's not, you know, by the standards of what you can read now in, in Econometric or the Journal of Economic Theory, there's not a lot of math in Keynes, but it's clearly a book with a mathematical sensibility. Um, and you'll also see people say, well, you know, the economists have this notion of equilibrium, and Keynes didn't do that, and, uh, but this is, uh, I'm not gonna go through, but this, it, this is where, chapter three, where he lays out the essentials of the general theory, and he says very much, I'm looking for an equilibrium that determines the level of unemployment. I'm looking for, you know, it's actually economist style, it's where uh, one curve crosses another curve. And, um, uh, and then we're gonna talk about what moves those curves around. Uh, so it's very much economics, uh, the way we do it in, in textbooks. But, um, and in, uh, in fact, uh, one thing that was really important about Keynes was that he actually changed the question. Um, what people did in economics pre-Keynes, uh, when they thought about business cycles, was they were very much, they thought they had to have a story about the whole business cycle. They had to have a story about why booms happen and why busts happen. Um, they had to get all of the dynamics. What they kind of neglected in all of that was the question, why is it that when there's a bust, that investors lose confidence or consumers become disheartened or whatever it is that happens in a bust, why does that lead to large-scale unemployment? You might say, well, that's obvious, but actually it wasn't at all obvious. And it, it and remains uh, to many people not at all obvious. And I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. That people would sort of say, well, you know, we're gonna obsess with, we're gonna try to figure out the whole ups and downs of investment. That's a lot of what uh, um, Austrian um, economics was about, but not they sort of skipped the step of explaining why it was that the point at which people realize that they overextended themselves leads to mass unemployment. And what Keynes did was to say, actually, you know, that's an interesting question. I'm gonna devote a short chapter near the end of the book to it. But um, really the crucial thing to ask is, how is it possible that we can have mass unemployment? Given that for whatever reason, investors, businessmen don't feel that they have a lot of demand for their products or don't want to invest, how is it that that leads to mass unemployment? And he laid out a story, and the crucial thing in being able to lay out that story was to break the notion that spending, uh, that income automatically generates spending, that supply creates its own demand. Um, now, I'm not gonna go further into Keynesian economics, but just say that, that is, that's what was crucial. And then, um, this was formalized, elaborated, I think most people, um, my generation, and uh, if it, we actually mostly encountered Keynes refracted through John Hicks's um, version, and then and then onwards into uh, uh, into other versions. But anyway, that was that's that's what we learned, and it it, it became a um, uh, you know all sudden, suddenly there was light. I think is the way to say it. It's, I know that's the way people at the time experienced it, that you had this Great Depression, um, and. No one could even think about how it was that it, such a thing was possible. Uh, Keynesian economics gave you the way to understand how such a thing was possible and also gave you a solution. Um, one of the things that happened at the time was that in many ways the most influential um, school of economics in the United States at that point was institutional economics, which was really much about studying the way things actually were. Trouble was, here came this Great Depression, and you would turn to the institutional economists and say, well, okay, now what do we do? And they say, well, that's a deep question, we need a lot of, it. And, and Keynes said, you know, turn this dial, increase G, that'll, that'll do it. And, uh, um, and that was extraordinarily helpful. Um, okay. Over time, there were, there was a gradual shift in emphasis. Keynes's insights were absorbed, they were popularized, they were, um, made much more simply than, than his version, with something lost, as always. But, uh, um, but there were a series of steps. Um, and they were not, this was not, well, let, let, me, let me just put this up here. Um, I realized afterwards that I changed my outline, so there is actually no part two here. But anyway, by rationalizing, um, what I mean by rationalizing macro is not, you know, trying to find some uh, way to make excuses for yourself. What I mean is the, the growing 
um, attempt to bring in rational behavior into, into the way we do macro. Um, and that really began with uh, uh, Paul Samuelson, uh, who not so much in his, in his journal articles as in his textbook, um, basically took on the task of how, said we have Keynes, which is this radical break, tells us a very different story, it's very much focused on depressions, and also we've just had this depression. Um, um, what about all that other stuff? What about supply and demand and, and welfare economics and efficiency? And what, Kay, what uh, Samuelson did was the, the neoclassical synthesis, which was first half of the book is about the business cycle and Keynesian economics and how you can use government policy to restore full employment. Second half of the book, now that we've got full employment, let's talk about the allocation of resources. And we're going to do all the stuff we were doing in, in microeconomics. Um, brilliantly successful, I think both as a, as a teaching technique. The, the Samuelson 48 book is, um, has been reissued, you know, as a, there's a fresh printing of the exact, but that's a facsimile of the original book. Um, it worked very well as, as a way to teach, and it also there was a lot of insight uh, that, that was there, and it, it served as a guide to policy. You could say what we should do is we should um, have macroeconomic policies to assure more or less full employment, and then we should have microeconomic policies that let markets work where they work and correct market failures where they don't. And that, I think, is still most of the wisdom of, of have, having good economic policy. But it did mean that you started to go back to thinking uh, a, a lot in terms of supply and demand and, and, and markets that, that, uh, that have fully employed resources, um, and kind of easy to slip into thinking that that's the real economics. And well, we have this stuff at the beginning, but that's kind of funny. It doesn't quite jibe with the rest. Um, for a long time, um, economics courses were taught, uh, intro courses were taught macro first, because after all, there had been this great depression in fairly recent memory, and the first thing you had to do was explain to people why that shouldn't be the only thing we worry about. And uh, um, at, over time, uh, gradually shifted. I, I haven't actually done the research. At some point, the economics textbooks flipped and started having microeconomics first and, and macroeconomics second. Course, uh, courses began switching. At Princeton, in a relic of uh, the way things were, Econ 101 is actually macro and 102 is, is micro, but everyone takes 102 first. Or they are urged to do that. So, um, okay. Second step along this road, and this is something that you know, not many people outside economics have any awareness of, and it was, it's not all that controversial, was the, um, uh, the attempts to think through the um, uh, consumer behavior. There was a problem. Um, in, the, in Keynes, there was a, uh, just a, a vague psychological argument that said that as people's income rises, they tend to spend part of it, but not all of it. Um, and uh, an assertion, actually, one thing that Keynes definitely got wrong, that as overall incomes rose, people would, share, would save a higher share of their income. Because after all, if you looked at, at a point in time, it was clear that rich people had higher savings rates than, than poor people. Um, turned out not to be true. Turned out that while it is true that at any given moment in time, rich people save more than poor people, there's been no upward trend in savings rates. Actually, if you're an English-speaking country that isn't Canada, downward trend in so savings rates. Uh, so, um, the, uh, how do you think about that? And um, uh, Albert Ando and, and Franco Modigliani on one side and, and Milton Friedman on the other, th there's a lot of differences in, in the presentation, but the basic idea was the same. Think about a person um, allocating his, his resources over a lifetime to achieve a relatively smooth path of consumption. You're going to take into account wealth. You're going to take into account expected future income. If you get a big windfall, you're likely to save most of it. Uh, but if you have what seems like a permanent increase in income, you're likely to, uh, to spend most of it. That turned out to account for the facts on consumption. It also had a side effect, which was to say, you know, modeling consumers as perfectly maximizing rational entities uh, can be productive. And the third step in this initial phase was thinking about inflation and unemployment. Um, it had been observed that there was, uh, 
I think it was here, didn't Phillips, Phillips was here when he came up with the Phillips curve, um, that there was a, a tendency for wages and prices to rise when unemployment was low and to fall when unemployment was high, and this became the, the Phillips curve. Um, and in the 60s, a lot of discussions of economic policy were about where, you know, how much uh, inflation would we be willing to accept to have a low unemployment rate, choosing a point on that trade-off. Um, but several people, um, but most notably Milton Friedman in his presidential address to the American Economic Association, um, and, and Ned Phelps, um, argued if, let's think about people setting prices. What would be the rational thing to do? Um, and the rational thing would be to take account of any expected inflation. If you think prices are gonna be rising, you can think of various scenarios. You can think of, of workers, uh, um, unions uh, demanding wages, but they're, you know, they have to demand a wage for some length of time, so they need to think about what's going to happen to prices over the length of the contract. Or you can see, think of companies trying to weigh, weigh competitive advantage against, uh, uh, against the, the, you know, the advantages of being able to charge a lot. Um, they need to think about what their competitors are likely to be charging a year or two from now. Um, that any story like that suggested that um, the rate of inflation should depend not just on the level of unemployment, but should depend on the expected future rate of inflation. And that, uh, in particular, that it should be about one for one. That uh, at any given level of unemployment, there should be many possible rates of inflation, depending on what's, what was in people's expectations. Um, this was, well, let me just show you the pictures. Um, this was what people were looking at in the, in the 60s, U.S. data, obviously. Unemployment for the uh, data wonks, I'm actually using core PCE inflation, never mind. It's uh, taking out food and energy prices and, and so on. Um, you know, pretty, for, for economics, that's a pretty good relationship. You might have thought, well, that's something we can count on. Um, what Friedman said this is just the text, it's, it's uh, um, what he said was, well, uh, if there is no permanent trade-off, because if, if, if inflation goes on for a while, actually, put it back here, if inflation goes, suppose you, you choose, uh, you know, a 3.5% unemployment rate, this gets you 4.5% inflation. Uh, after a while, people start to expect 4.5% inflation, and the inflation rate will start to rise, even if the unemployment rate stays where it is. And eventually, if you keep on doing this, you, you're going to find the inflation rate going higher and higher. And then you say, well, we've got to bring it down. You bring up the unemployment rate. And it's going to look like a much worse trade-off than what you had before people got that higher inflation rate built in. In fact, as people pointed out, um, what that story seemed to imply not a simple curve relating unemployment to inflation, but that over time, unemployment versus inflation should follow um, clockwise spirals, raise the, uh, you know, up and uh, get a high in expect inflation rate, then you have to squeeze it back down, then it, it and um, that's what happened. Um, um, that is, you know, that's one of the great predictive successes of economics, because this was predicted before it happened. Um, and as a result, you know, huge prestige, justifiably, for Milton Friedman. Uh, Nobel Prizes first for him, and then many, many years later for Ned Phelps. Um, the, um, you know, this was, this was good stuff. What it seemed to say, though, was that, you know, you get, you, you get, you get a long way, you, you get ahead in macro by saying, you know, people are smart, people are rational. Let's take that rationality into account. And that's where things started to go haywire. So here's my quick history of what happened to macro. Um, Robert Lucas, along with others, took Friedman's analysis, I think, more seriously than Friedman, with his strong reality sense, uh, was willing to do. Uh, and said, well, OK, but where, does, where do expectations about inflation come from? Um, Friedman and, and many people still, I mean, when we do this stuff, we, people like me tend to say, well, people form their expectations of inflation gradually over time. Uh, they sort of look at the, at the past and, and update. Um, but as, as a number of people pointed out, Lucas and, and others were uh, 
why, why not assume that people, you know, have access to the same information economists do? Why not assume that they can do the, the rational thing and, and get a, a for, form the best forecast given the available information? All this taking place at the same time that the bottom, I mentioned efficient markets theory was, was taking over finance. So this whole notion that markets embody all the information was, was you know, part of the spirit of the times. Um, and then the question is, well, then why do we see what looks like a trade-off between unemployment and inflation? And Lucas's answer was um, essentially noise. Um, an individual worker, an individual firm, um, can't easily tell the difference between a rise in the price or a rise in the wage that's due to something special to that individual firm, which they ought to react to by producing more. Um, or a rise in the price that's part of general inflation, which you ought not to react to because nothing, nothing real has changed. And so Lucas rephrased this thing as a, as a, um, a problem of, of smart agents in the economy. By the way, that's one of the telltales, which school of economics you, if, if people who can actually refer to the, the players and their models as, as people uh, come from one side, and if they, if they balk at that and, and say agents instead, then they're for the other side. Um, but anyway, um, the, uh, the uh, right, it became a signal extraction problem, which led to nice math and great stuff and tremendously influential work. About the time that I would, was just starting out and coming out of grad school, so I was very aware of these things, um, there became an obvious problem with that story, which was that there's just too much information clearly, readily available. Uh, think about what's happening right now. Um, it does not make sense to say that the reason that workers in the United States and the UK are, um, are, are letting themselves be laid off rather than accept a cut in their wages is because they can't tell whether the decline in demand for their services is idiosyncratic or the result of an economy-wide recession, right? It's sort of pretty obvious, and in fact, you know, it's just, there's just way too much information. Uh, even in the models, just throwing in interest rates, uh, uh, immediate, you know, the, the ability of people to observe interest rates destroyed the, the Lucas-type model. So you had to either assume that people were mysteriously unaware of data that everybody's got out there, or say there was something wrong with the story which left you with a choice to make as an economist. One way was to say, okay, we, we're not quite sure why uh, people don't behave in that hyper-rational fashion, um, but they don't. And so we're gonna sort of stick some uh, small deviations from perfect rationality into the model and, and go on from there. And that's the, that's, that's the New Keynesian um, direction. Um, which is pretty much you know, the people I hang out with, right? Uh, um, the other is to say, no, it must be true that people are doing the rational thing. So all of this notion that we have an aggregate, that, that, that demand is driving the business cycle must be wrong. Um, and it must instead be that there's a completely different story. It must, in fact, be that that, uh, that, that, that whole line of thought is wrong and, and it must be optimal behavior. And, uh, and that's, um, that's real business cycle theory. Um, and if there's an RBC person in this room, they're about to get, they're probably mad at me already, so it's not gonna do any more harm. Uh, but the, uh, um, the, the driving force in the RBC models, real business cycle, uh, became um, uh, technological shocks. You have favorable or unfavorable fluctuations in productivity. And you ask, well wait, what about the huge changes in employment over the business cycle? And that became a rational response in the face of intertemporal labor substitution, uh, which is saying, the way I like to explain it, they, this school does not particularly like um, toy, toy models and toy examples, but, but I, uh, which is very much the, the other school's style. But I'd say, think about a farmer uh, facing fluctuating weather. You'll discover that the farmer produces a lot less on days with bad weather. Partly that's because he's less productive when the weather is bad, but it's also because since the weather is bad, he just stays in that day and, uh, and then works hard on the days when the weather is good. And so you get these big fluctuations both in labor input and in productivity, and off you go. Um, by the way, the, the freshwater 
Uh, salt water, that's Bob Hall many, many years ago. It just turns out in the United States that the, 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 uh, the places that continued to think that Keynes was onto something tended to be Harvard, Yale, MIT, uh, Stanford, Berkeley, uh, and the places that thought it was all nonsense tended to be uh, uh, Chicago, uh, Rochester, Carnegie, uh, Mellon, and Pittsburgh, and so on. So somehow or other, the, the, the coast stayed somewhat Keynesian. Um, the, um, okay. Um, in response to a question, I think it was last lecture, somebody asked, you know, where, where are the economists? I, I said that, that you know, the, the economics departments could be divided into uh, two camps. Uh, the camps that spent most of their time on models that, in which this crisis uh, couldn't possibly happen, and those that spend all of their time on models in which this crisis couldn't possibly happen. And, th and there you have them. Uh, so the New Keynesians um, and, and the uh, uh, spend most of their time on models in which this can't possibly happen. In fact, in saltwater schools, you, people do study real business cycle models. Um, and the, the real business cycle, uh, where uh, they, they certainly don't see any of the other stuff. Um, and uh, now, there's a couple of things to say uh, about um, where even Keynesian, or in this case, new Keynesian economics went. Um, one is that, um, that, that the New Keynesians, and, and myself included in this, because to the extent I did work in this area, did tend to be in that, in that vein, um, basically suffered from maximization envy. Um, that, that people, you would try to have as much as possible of your model be, uh, be based upon perfectly rational uh, agents. You try to make everything, you know, all, dot all your I's, cross all your T's. And it, in, in a way, what your notion of what it meant, it wasn't really economic theory unless you had lots of maximization going on. It, uh, so it, it, it's, uh, so that's, that's the way, you, and it, it, you know, it's, 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 partly, it's partly that there were these real successes of people thinking about what, what, would, what would smart people do in the economy. Uh, but it was also that you know, it gave you a way to show that you'd actually done something, right? You'd actually solved all of these equations with these uh, first and second derivatives. So you, you were uh, um, tending to push in that direction. There's also a, a strong tendency, um, almost I'd say kind of a wish to believe that we were actually converging on, on some common view. Um, and uh, this is uh, my esteemed former colleague, now chief economist at the IMF, uh, Olivier Blanchard, actually had a piece, uh, released his working paper just last summer uh, on the state of macro, uh, in which he says uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the battles are over, we've reached a lot of reconciliation, of course there are still things, but we've really come together. Um, that has turned out to be spectacularly untrue. Um, and what's, what's turned out to be untrue, it, what's actually turned out, and I, I didn't fully realize this, I think none of us did until we got into this crisis, um, is uh, that the um, people who went down the, the, uh, the left fork there, really should have had those reversed, I guess, should have been on the right fork, right? But anyway, the people who went down the left fork, um, not only did they not teach any of the Keynesian ideas, they actually had lost sight of what, of what, the, what the Civil War in economics was about. Um, or they, they, they misunderstood where, where it was that the dividing line came. So I almost hate to, well, this, the, just, I hate to pick out individuals, but I'm just using a convenient quote. So this was, uh, there was an article in Bloomberg, uh, rather nice piece uh, about the, the influence of James Tobin um, on, on the economy. Oh, by the way, side remark. Uh, if you ask, where is, the, where is the intellectual basis for the policies we're, we're now following, the policies that I think are helping to at least contain this thing? Uh, the fiscal policy is, uh, is Keynes. The unconventional monetary policy, the, the idea that if, if you've run out of room by just, uh, by just printing money, you can get some traction by by buying other assets, that's straight Tobin. It's coming straight out of the work of Jim Tobin in, in the 1960s on, on, on financial markets. Um, and so it is, it is really true that to a large extent, our, our policy is in, in fact being based on, on the work of James Tobin. So John Cochran, um, 
been very hostile to uh, to the activist policies that are being followed. Uh, well, you see what he says that. Uh, uh, it's not part of what anybody has taught graduate students, this is fiscal policy since the 1960s, which is not true, by the way. I mean, it certainly was taught at least to some extent to graduate students in the saltwater schools, but I guess that's, we're not anybody. Um, and uh, their fairy tales have been proved false. Um, and um, he explained that you know, if, if the government borrows money, that's money that can't be spent elsewhere. And so if the government borrows money, it, it has to reduce private spending by the same amount, and therefore, it's not going to do anything, which is straight says law. It's right back to what Keynes was going to great lengths to free people from um, um, 73 years ago in the general theory. Uh, but a lot of the profession doesn't know that, doesn't know about that whole argument. It's, it just, um, you've been seeing a lot of people presenting as a fresh, deep, new insight hey, you know, there's this thing, spending has to equal income, uh, savings has to equal investment, and quite unaware that there was a previous tradition. Um, so that's left us with a good part of the, as I said, a, a good part of, of what we've done in macroeconomics these past 30 years, and a good part of the profession, um, spectacularly useless at best and, and positively harmful at, at, at worst. So this is, this is part of our problem. But even among those who didn't forget that, uh, that, oh, by the way, just one more thing to say. If you believe that the government borrowing and spending cannot increase demand, then you also have to believe that it makes no difference what, say, the state of business confidence is. Because if one business decides to expand its investment and borrow more, that must just be pulling funds away from someone else who would have spent the money, right? You cannot simultaneously believe that, that business confidence matters and that fiscal policy is irrelevant. It's it's all part of the same story. But again, that that understanding is something that got lost over the uh, uh, over the decades. Um, so um, it, I use the phrase on one of my blog posts that we we've entered a dark age of macroeconomics um, in 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 a precise sense. That what made the dark ages dark wasn't the fact that people didn't know a lot. It was the fact that they'd forgotten so much that the Greeks and Romans knew. And so that's uh, sort of what, where we are in, 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 in a lot of, of economics. Um, even among the saltwater economists, um, there was certainly a loss of focus on things that have turned out to be terribly important right now. And just to say fiscal policy, we're all now talking about fiscal policy and the, the likely effects, the, the actually the magnitude is terribly important now for assessing the policies. So how much work have we done on fiscal policy? Um, actually, that Olivier Blanchard paper on the state of macro, which was written just before the crisis went into overdrive, uh, doesn't mention fiscal policy. Uh, it's, only a, it's all about monetary policy. Um, which is not because Olivier has never thought of these things, but he just didn't think that, given the state of discourse in the field, it was relevant enough. Um, I looked at the, um, uh, the NBER working papers, National Bureau of Economic Research, that the National Bureau of Economic Research in its modern incarnation is, uh, um, is, is the old boy network uh, made flesh, I guess. It's, uh, it, uh, it, not in all parts of economics, but in large parts, everybody who's anybody is part of it, and, and research gets released as, as working papers first and, it, uh, and has a searchable database, which is what's helpful. Um, so the, um, between 1985 and, and 2000, there were about 7,000 NBER working papers released, of which five said anything in their title over abstract about fiscal policy. Now, the numbers started to increase after 2000, although still only at the rate of a handful a year, most of them inspired by uh, either the Bush tax cuts or Japan. So it, it's, uh, but just tells you this whole long period, the whole discussion of fiscal policy essentially disappeared from macroeconomics. Um, the other thing is, and now this is, um, Keynes really put the question of why demand fluctuates um, on one side, um, but certainly it's something that we ought to be interested in. Uh, particularly, we ought to have some way of thinking about when it is that the bottom is likely to fall out on the economy. But almost nothing done on that. Uh, almost all of, well, you know, if, if you've got a model where everybody is rational, 
Um, and the only thing that's going on is you have some uh, short-term price stickiness uh, because for some reason, which we can't quite model, monop monopolistically competitive firms are, don't want to change their prices too often, which is basically the way new Keynesian models tend to work. Um, it's going to be hard to get you know, the abrupt collapse of the world financial system uh, in that kind of model. And so it really wasn't, wasn't in there at all. Um, there were people who did think about these things. Um, the, uh, uh, so now we've had a, a tremendous revival in, the, uh, in references to, to Hyman Minsky, um, who was a very much out of the mainstream uh, writer on economics in, in, uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and uh, by the way, the reason for the title of the lecture is, is uh, just I happen to remember the, this, uh, the, this old movie. Um, the uh, um, different Minsky. Um, <laughs> Um, Minsky is, um, it's actually interesting to, to think about, the, Minsky's work is, is, it's not easily readable. Um, there is a core insight which is now spectacularly right, which is that over extended periods when there hasn't been a major economic crisis, people and especially financial institutions get further and further into leverage. And then there comes a moment, the Minsky moment, when people say, oh my god, I've got too much leverage, and they all try to reduce it at the same time, and, uh, and the result is, is catastrophe. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent story for understanding what happened to us right now. Um, and it's also it's a, it's a good story now, in retrospect, for thinking. Uh, I mentioned in the last talk that when we tried to make sense of the crises in, East, in Southeast Asia or in Argentina, those were, in fact, Minsky moments, but none of us thought of it that way. Um, Minsky did not have much impact, uh, partly because the whole drift of the profession was away from that, partly because, I think this is an interesting contrast with Keynes, um, Minsky basically said everything you guys are doing is wrong and threw out the whole thing and was, did not make much contact at all. Um, and there, there are a bunch, there's lots of stuff in Minsky that I don't think is right, but maybe, maybe I'm missing something, but it's not, it's, it's not directly relevant. Basically char challenging the whole marginal productivity theory of, of, uh, of incomes. Uh, it goes for, I'm talking Greek to most people here, but Koletsky and income distribution theory. A uh, whole lot of uh, um, things that, that you, know, you can believe or not believe, but were certainly heterodox, and there was sort of too much heterodoxy, the whole thing thrown at you. So who is going to plow through that to the, uh, to the really good insights in one chapter about, about uh, um, and it's, it's interesting, because Keynes, Keynes was uh, a total insider. He actually says that early on. He says, I, I, I used to myself believe these, these, uh, these things, so I'm very, very aware of their strong points. And so he, it's a, it's a precise bit by bit demolition of, of, of your preconceptions. And that's not there. But what's the point is, of course, that, that nonetheless, we can criticize the sales job, but there was something very important that we weren't even talking about. And it was really only outsiders like Minsky who were talking about. Where do we go from here? Um, first of all, I think economists you know, really have got to go back and, uh, and say that, that these basic uh, Keynesian type models are need to be studied. People certainly need, need to know that that there is this issue about uh, about demand. Uh, they need to know that the uh, that sometimes uh, things that can't be fully justified in terms of maximization are really important. Uh, I think we need to have a whole different style of of teaching. We we it, it's I I don't qu quite know how we make that happen. You know, the sociology of the profession is that people you know win their spurs by doing difficult stuff. Uh, but we have to find some way to, to get it back. And we certainly have to have it back in the courses. Uh, a lot of it's just disappeared. Um, what does the research program look like? And that's what's really difficult. Because you want to say, well, OK, so how do we do this right? Can we use behavioral economics to, to do Minsky? And the answer is, I think, not yet. Um, the behavioral economics, as far as I can make it, is so far mostly serving uh, for those who don't know, behavioral economics is basically saying, you know, uh, real people don't maximize 
uh, and we can get we have a lot of interesting insights into the way people behave, but I don't think it's sufficiently general to start doing macroeconomics with it yet. But it is liberating. Let's you say maybe we, we need to to have some more realistic descriptions. Um, you can read a lot of Keynes as a, an extended essay in behavioral economics, but, but just based on his informal observation, and maybe we can do better than that. A lot of what I think we can do is, um, is go back to really looking at history. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I mean, economists have done empirical work, and actually in many ways this is a golden age for empirical work in economics, though not so much in macro uh, until recently. Um, but um, you know, where did macroeconomics actually start? It actually started not with Keynes, although I say all the understanding began with Keynes, but it began with uh, the business cycle measurement, uh, actually in the National Bureau of Economic Research in an earlier incarnation, they just gathered lots of data and looked at what seemed to happen over the course of a typical business cycle. Uh, now that never did actually lead to a general theory of why we have booms and busts. It just had, gave some insights, but it was an interesting thing. It was certainly a, a useful preliminary way to go about stuff. And I've been struck by the extent to which crisis analysis even before it became global, a lot of the analyses of developing country crises, uh, people have turned back to the style of just saying, let's look at, let's look at what happened in a lot of crises. Let's, let's, uh, let's look at, at, the, uh, at, at what an, an average crisis looks like. Um, it's been, um, I was talking with some people earlier today, uh, Ken Rogoff um, has been doing work with Carmen Reinhardt. Um, um, Carmen has done a lot of these developing country uh, crises with this method of just looking at a bunch of them and, and gathering comparative data. Um, Ken Rogoff has not been doing that. He has a paper with, with uh, uh, Carmen Reinhardt that is about what typically happens after financial crises, uh, which is, by the way, deeply depressing. The answer is really bad stuff for a really long time. But, it's, uh, um, but what's really interesting is Ken is, is the, uh, in the international field, Ken is the supreme New Keynesian theorist. Uh, I guess along with Maury Osfeld, my co-author on an, another book, uh, but but you know he, the, what you think of coming from Ken Rogoff is is papers where at a certain point you hit equation 63 and you say oh boy this is this is important stuff now I need another aspirin um, but uh, but he hims but he being you know really a really really good economist has said you know. Um, right now, we just need to know what actually happens in these crises, and is willing to do this deep historical work to figure out uh, what what patterns we can discern from it. Um, it's been uh, um, it's been an education. Uh, it, it certainly uh, it is kind of depressing that most of the practical guidance we've gotten in dealing with this crisis really has come from very old economics. Uh, but I guess in the end, the main thing is to be grateful that we at least had that and that at least as of this evening, it looks like it won't be Great Depression too. Let's hope I'm right about that. Thanks. Thank you, Paul, for your usual brilliant lecture. Um, I think that we have time for questions, so yes. perhaps you can handle this from the yeah, podium. Yeah, I think I can do this uh, if so. I'll try. Are there are mics someplace, yeah, down there. No, we should use the mic. Remember, this is being a uh, oh, podcast, webcast, ca sure, everything okay. cast. So. Um, well, one of the, uh, the, the uh, economists, I mean, thanks for the lecture, and then um, it's good when you're sort of a middle-aged man like myself to sort of regain a little bit of the theory. But when, when I was here many years ago, uh, there was a man called Hayek, whom you mentioned. Yep. And of Hay Hayek, of course, who was around these halls and was invited by Keynes to come to Cam Cambridge and who was, according to Cambridge, was uh, absolutely mad but also very interesting. But it strikes me that he was, um, he was sort of missing from your lecture. It could be that he's totally obsolete and he's one of the, the Minsky's. But, but some of the things that he said about um, 
we're not knowing enough, uh, you know, the yeah. system being too complex seems to me to be perhaps relevant in some way or another. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not a real scholar of, of, of any of this, actually, of any of these, uh, right? Intellectual history is something I'm, I'm coming into now because it just seems really relevant at the moment. But, um, but Hayek, you know, the Austrian business cycle theory was... That was what I was including in the people who were really into booms and busts and not really, sort of didn't realize there was a problem about explaining why it was that, that, uh, that, that the bust created mass unemployment. And what could have happened is that Hayek um, and the other Austrians could have said, oh, now that we've got Keynes, we can integrate this together. But they never did that. Instead, they, they were furious against it, um, partly because they, there was an ideological thing. They they were big defenders of the free enterprise system, and um, and you know Hayek is on record as having been dead set against any attempt to actually reflate the economy during the Great Depression because um, you 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 didn't want to interfere with the natural process. Actually, Schumpeter also has this horrible thing about well you know if we if we try to pump up the money supply or anything like that that will leave the work of depression undone. So um, uh, and. Uh, and you do find some of that coming back in, in, in some of the current discussions, too. So I, th I think there was a missed opportunity. Now, in some ways, you can say that there's a, there's a, a, a hint of Austrianism in, in Minsky, although it's funny because total opposite side of the political spectrum. But, uh, but it, it just, uh, you, you go back and read Hayek on, on the business cycle, and it's like he sheared off at a, uh, at a crucial point. And one more thing I think I should mention, uh, this kind of cycle theorizing, uh, Minsky is, is a bit guilty of it, but, but the Austrians much more so. There's this lavishing attention on the excesses of the boom. And then it's sort of losing interest when it comes to, okay, now we've got this slump, now what do we do? And, uh, and that's, that, that turns out to be a real problem as well. Yeah. Okay. I'll try going upstairs in a minute. Um, hi. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Islamic economics, but I'm sure you know more than I have read about it. Um, I was wondering how much you think that Islamic economics and the financial system, which uh, Islamic finance as they call it, is an alternative system or perhaps uh, something better which we can move on to. Um, all I know about Islamic economics is I had one of my thesis advisees writing about Islamic bonds, which I gather the market is doing rather well, but I don't know anything more than that. And I really probably should reserve, I shouldn't say more. So, way up there. Um, yes, okay. Sweeney recently wrote a paper about uh, shadow money, where in the boom, uh, for instance, a bond takes on the role of money, and then during the bust, loses this role again because of higher cuts and so on. And they argue that everything the Fed's doing now is not necessarily going to lead to, to inflation because it basically fills up the gap created by the disappearance of, of this shadow money. What's your take on this? Um, that's actually more or less what I said in uh, in the first lecture. I I think the, or I would put it a little differently, but I think it's not that different in point of view. The, the Fed is really serving as the financial intermediary of last resort. If you think about what's actually happening, it's more. It's not so much that the Fed is printing money as that the public is rushing to safety in the form of treasury bills and also insured bank deposits. The banks are accumulating huge reserves at the Fed, uh, the Treasury has also lent some money to the Fed, and then the Fed is going out there and making the loans to the private, the, the banks are unwilling to lend to the private sector as well, so the Fed is actually out there doing the lending to the private sector with money that's being put in their care by the banks. So what looks like by conventional measurement, like a huge increase in the monetary base, which consists primarily of just increased bank deposits at the Federal, private bank deposits at the Federal Reserve, is really just, um, the normal lending process being cycled through the Fred, through the Fed instead of through the the private banking system, um, and I think it's 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 not the way you want to run your financial system for any length of time, but right now it's a lot better than not doing it at all. At the moment, it, it is it is in fact uh, uh, the, uh, um, you know, the the Federal Reserve coming to the rescue, keeping the markets running when otherwise they might just uh, shrivel up in, in the face of the panic. Try with up there. Yeah. 
Uh, you said that you didn't believe that behavioral economics was ready to, uh, for macro modeling of irrationality yet. I wonder uh, if you think that game theory uh, could ex like explain the current situation in macroeconomics because in game theory in micro you have a clear situation where every agent is behaving rationally and causing yeah. efficiency disaster and currently everyone is playing deleverage except the Fed that is levering up. Yeah, in, in, a, in a very basic sense, but you know, let me say that, that um, macro theorists of the past generation, uh, if I might say, in general, I would say knew too much game theory. Uh, right? I mean, you know, it's not, it, was not, it was not absence of that that's the problem. It was, um, it, for, for a lot of the 80s, less so since, for the, a lot of the 80s, what, um, you know, what, uh, game theory was a hammer in search of nails all over economics. And so, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, come down here. There we go. I'm from India. India doesn't have a stimulus package uh, like that of the USA or, the, or China, but its economy has remained relatively unravaged uh, uh, despite the global downturn. Yeah. Do you think this happy state of affairs is likely to continue, or there's simply some catching up to do with the economies, other economies on their way down? Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm uh, under tutelaged on the Indian economy. Actually, one of those things that, I'm hoping to spend some time on, but haven't gotten to yet. Um, what I will say is that, I mean, India has been hit, no question, but th the, the countries that have been worst hit, uh, actually, the, the countries that have been second worst hit are the countries that had huge financial excesses. The countries that have been worst hit are the countries that are big exporters of durable manufactured goods. Um, India uh, is not in that category. India's globalization has been, uh, it's, it's been a lot more than call centers, but, but you know, if you think about that kind of uh, as the caricature, it's, it's been a very different sort of thing and not probably as cyclical. China's been less hit than Japan or South Korea because although it's manufactured exports, it's not durable stuff. It's not, it's, it's not cars and, and, and heavy goods. So I, I think it's probably the case that India is just not as, you know, just by the nature of what it's producing just turned out to be not as vulnerable. But how, you know, how, how well that goes along, I don't know. It's, 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 it's uh, as I say, I, that, at, we've now, I've now told you everything I know about India. <laughs> okay, try down, uh, right at the back. Um, uh, yeah, that's good. Sorry. Um, there's another macroeconomist uh, like Minsky who will remain hidden a little bit, uh, uh, Lehon, who, would, uh, who worked on complexity economics. Do you think that there's, um, there's a, w a road for the research program along the complexity theory? Okay, uh, okay. Um, I actually dabbled in that stuff myself uh, in mid 90s and uh, complexity theory and economics, and it wasn't very, um, it, 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 it doesn't seem to work, uh, it, 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 it didn't seem productive, and a lot of people did try. I mean, one, one thing one does need to realize about, you know, economics as a profession is that there are thousands of smart graduate students um, searching for something that will let them do work, and it, if something doesn't uh, flourish, um, it's, it's either because it, it you know, doesn't generate the kind of papers that, that you can publish nowadays or, um, or because it really doesn't have anything to it. And it, uh, if, there, if complexity theory had worked um, as, as, a, as an approach, I think you would have seen a lot of, you know, a lot of people were trying for it and it didn't, didn't seem to work. The, the one piece out of all of that stuff, the self-organizing systems and uh, um, is, is the power laws. Uh, where we do find striking power laws in economics, like in other things, uh, uh, the bizarrely precise power law in the sizes of cities. And the trouble with that is that we still, we still can't, despite seeing it, we don't seem to have a very good theory of why it's there. And, and uh, uh, I think I said somewhere, law, Zipf's law is the, is the law on sizes of cities, and that anyone who spends too much time thinking about Zipf's law goes mad. Um, so. Uh, no, I, I, that unfortunately, that's another one. You know, there is always this question. I, 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 let me say, I'm, I, I'm enough of a stuck in the mud 
orthodox type to say that it's very unlikely that you'll get great, um, that, that, that people who are coming from completely outside the paradigm are going to uh, produce what we need. Because in spite of the harsh words I've had for some of the directions we've gone, there have been a lot of smart people working on you know, economics in general for a couple hundred years and macroeconomics for 70 years. And you have to have some understanding of the false turnings other people have taken to find the new good turning. And, and uh, so, so the real total outsiders. Um, uh, Minsky would come close in the sense of being somebody who really was not in the paradigm, but he even knew, he, but he did in fact know the field pretty well. He just thought it was all hooey, but he did actually know the field pretty well, and, and if you can read it, and, and even so, that, that he's, he's, he's got this one crucial insight, which we all should have been aware of, um, but the really left field approaches like complexity theory uh, have, I think, just not, not much chance of actually of actually doing doing the trick of solving our problems. I'll try. Uh, let's go back there. I have got a. I have a question about uh, equity. Um, all the, the the bank bailouts seem to be a big shift of resources from society to the relatively rich. Um, how about the the response to that in terms of the stimulus packages? And then finally, when it comes to paying back government debt, are the rich members of society going to be able to skip out of the taxman's clutches and are uh, corporates going to also similarly escape? What, what's the equity impact of all this? Okay, uh, you know, equity is one reason why I wanted um, bank bailouts to go along with, uh, with temporary receivership for, for the weakest banks. And, uh, we haven't done that for the most part, although in a few cases it has happened if you look across countries. Um, I think it's not as much of a bailout for, you know, it's not, it's not as if in the U.S. the TARP has, is $700 billion given to rich people. It's, uh, it's um, it, 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 a good part of the benefits of that. First of all, some of it, the money, the government will get a fair bit of the money back, and, and a good part of the benefits will... Um, uh, will in fact flow to, to the broader public. But still, yeah, there, there's been a tendency for people who are already doing very well to, to get to do very well out of it. Um, the, um, the, the, I don't believe we're going to see rich people. Look, it's not true, actually. It's funny. In the United States, it was actually tended to be people on the right who would say, oh, you know, you, point, there's no point raising taxes on the rich, they just uh, avoid them, uh, which is obviously sometimes true, but not by a long shot uh, uh, true on average. That we do actually, do we do manage to have progressive taxes. We do manage to collect a lot of taxes on the wealthy, and we can collect more, and, and so we'll have to do that. Now, I do suspect that in the end, um, in the United States, I'm not so sure about elsewhere, but in the United States, in the end, to pay for the social programs we, we should have, and uh, only to a minor extent to pay for the debt we're running up. That's a much smaller issue than people think. Uh, we will need more taxes, and some of them will have to be broad-based. Will have to be something like a VAT, uh, rather than, you can't raise all the money we need just by raising the top marginal tax rate. Raise a lot because there's so much money up there these days, but but not nearly enough. So it, so we'll have to it it'll be more broadly shared. Paul, okay. some people in front. Oh, you know I, you're invis you're invisible from this point of view. So okay, go. We got let get the. Uh, you mentioned the. We all have our blind spots. You you, you mentioned the jump start. Uh, um, start, uh, Keynes searching for the jump start, 1930, and it lasted him till 39 to finally find a, uh, a realization of it. Uh, how would you characterize contemporary versions of uh, the jump start school? Oh, you know, it's actually interesting. Keynes never used anything like jump start, uh, to my knowledge, jump start metaphor. And his, his model is not one in which governments, you give the economy a kick with government spending uh, I'll I'll see, but I don't know. Uh, but it, it in any case, it's it's not it's not. Uh, um, I, I know every, people couldn't come to everyone couldn't come to all three. But one of the one of the mysteries actually is why World War II did function like a jump start. That is why the economy kept on going even after the the impulse was gone. And I think that had a lot to do with with the um, 
uh, repairing of private sector balance sheets that took place during the war. Um, but uh, in any case, where are we now relatively? Um, we are, what we're doing now is closer to, um, to, to what the New Deal did, which was spend enough to mitigate the depression, but certainly not enough to produce recovery. It, we're, uh, so by the numbers, we, uh, you can do it a couple of ways which come out more or less the same. Um, the U.S. economy right now, uh, the U.S. economy in the first quarter was probably operating about 6% below capacity. The Obama stimulus at its peak, which will come in the second half of next year, will be about 2.5% of GDP. Um, the, uh, the U.S. economy is now 6 million jobs down. And if you account in the increase in employment that should have happened just to keep up with growth in the working age population, we're about seven and a half million jobs down, and that will surely grow. Um, the Obama stimulus uh, is supposed to raise employment by three and a half million relative to where it would otherwise be. So all of these things say that what we have in the United States, which has got the biggest discretionary stimulus plan, we have a, a mitigating policy. I mean, it's got a terror, the, the name of the, of the bill is uh, the American Re Recovery and, Re um, and the American Reconstruction and Recovery Act, which is actually a slightly deceptive title. It's, it's actually the American, let's make this recession not as bad as it would have otherwise have been act, uh, which I guess does, doesn't sell in Congress. So um, it's not as bad, not nearly as bad as, as, as EGTRA and JEGTRA, the two push uh, economic growth, tax relief, and blah, 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 and uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I keep on thinking there's going to be the, the, the motherhood patriotism and, and apple pie reconciliation and papra. Uh, but anyway, um, so no, it, the, what we have now is we, we have policies that actually even the, the Obama, you know, they, they are quite honest about the economics. The Obama, um, the document laying out the act uh, said that, uh, predicted that the economy would have started to recover. Uh, and that within five years, even on its own, it would be back to normal levels of unemployment, uh, but that the act would shave off a lot of the hump. So that's, that's the nature of the policies we now have. They're not policies for recovery. They're not policies for jumpstart. They're policies to mitigate. Now, if, uh, the reason that they predicted that we return to full employment in five years is that as a convention, government projections always assume that you'll return to full employment in five years. There wasn't really a very good explanation of why that was supposed to happen, but, but you know, it, it, was, it was just standard practice. Uh, okay, let me try down here, which I probably wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Can we get up? I'm sorry, I made it. Referring to the critical article you have written last December about German Finance Minister Pesht yeah. Einbrück, I would like to know what's your opinion about him today and obviously related to that, do you think Germany is still not doing enough as yeah. Europe's largest economy? Um, yeah, it, the interesting, now Germany is actually doing more than you would have imagined from what they say. I mean, actually, there's, there's more discretionary stimulus going on in Germany than, than, uh, uh, than, than Mr. Steinbrook's uh, uh, remarks, which leads you, you know, he talks about how awful it is to do crass Keynesianism and then does a fair bit of it. Um, but the, uh, but not, re not remotely enough. And, uh, and, and the, the rhetoric actually really does hurt. I mean, Europe really should be having um, a coordinated fiscal stimulus. And if Germany is going out there denouncing the very idea, you're not going to get that. Um, the, um, and worse now, we have uh, Merkel um, you know, talking about what a terrible thing it is to have central banks going out there and doing unconventional monetary policy when one of the big problems for Europe, I believe, is in fact that the ECB is not doing sufficient uh, unconventional policy, not matching the Fed and the Bank of England, which is doing at least a fair bit uh, in that regard. Um, and special problem because the ECB, although it's independent, it, to do those unconventional policies, you really do need the financial backstop of the Treasury. You know, I, I 
think I said this last time, but you know, the, the Fed is able to be very bold in its policies because it's got a, a guarantee that the Treasury will make it whole afterwards. So, you know, when, when the dust is all settled, they send the invoice over to, uh, to, to 15th Street, which is, you know, thank you, uh, we, this is, will be $337 billion for services rendered. And um, the ECB can't do that institutionally, but it could, you could imagine that you could have at least some more backing from the major European governments, but if Germany is saying, oh, terrible, don't do anything like what the Fed is doing, uh, then that makes it worse. No, I th Germany is being spectacularly unhelpful in all of this. Um, and uh, that is a problem. So, way up in that corner, if we can get it, it there, just, just to uh, anybody, <laughs> or wherever it goes, that's fine. Doesn't. Uh, thank you. I have a question about the uh, real business cycle theory. So you were suggesting that the, uh, we have to go, go back to Keynesians to, to sort of understand the current crisis. Well, um, I was wondering that actually the real business cycle theory actually indeed has achieved some success in explaining the uh, U.S. macroeconomy in the last uh, five or six decades. So going forward, I was wondering, do we really want a unified theory to explain both crises or the normal days or we have to, like, for example, in crisis, we go back to Keynesian. Well, in normal days, we have to use real business okay. cycle theory. Um, I am, from the point of view of, of real business cycle people, a real Philistine. I think that the, uh, that, that the, the, the supposed explanation is actually uh, reversed causation. That the, the adverse technological shocks that the RBC people are estimating are actually, you know, productivity does tend to decline in recessions. Um, and so RBC th people say, that's the cause of what's happening. I think it's the effect. I think it's, it, what's actually happening is that, that companies tend to hoard workers during recessions, and so measured productivity goes down, and, and it's, that it's all a, a misinterpretation. And that's being a really, that, that's being an ugly saltwater economist. Uh, but I, I, th I think the whole enterprise was, was misconceived. It's just, I'll be blunt about that, okay? Uh, okay, fine. I think we can take maybe two more, so. Uh, oh, up there? Great. Thanks. Um, given what, sorry. Professor, uh, given where we are today, uh, all that's said and done and guaranteed, could you outline a worst possible nightmare scenario for the U.S. economy? <laughs> <laughs> I have two, oh, okay. two more questions, though. How would we get there? And, and finally, what, what would we need to get out of that? Oh, boy. <laughs> wow. Um, no, I mean, I think the nightmare scenario would be that we have a, a renewed run on the financial system that people uh, once again decide, and at the same time, we have a collapse in, in confidence in the U.S. government's uh, uh, fiscal ability to, to deal with, with it. And that would, um, if you want to say, you know, how could, that, how could people totally lose confidence in the, in the U.S. government? It would be that, that, uh, that it would be essentially have to be a, a political judgment a political judgment that the U.S. political system is so messed up, so riven by partisan divisions that, that we will actually uh, be unable to agree on, on measures to avoid default. And so if, if the U.S. is suddenly degraded, you know, if, if the financial sector loses all public confidence, at the same time the U.S. government is degraded to, uh, is downgraded to, to, uh, to BBB or maybe junk bond status, uh, then, then we have no ability, you know, and this, uh, look, I mean, such things do happen, right? If you, you know, by the numbers, uh, it was not impossible for Argentina to have avoided a catastrophic uh, collapse in, in, in 2002, but, but no one believed that politically they could, and so the whole thing imploded. Um, and they did, in, in the end, you know, repudiate about 70% of the value of their debt. So, so um, if, if people conclude that the United States is Argentina, uh, then, then all hell can can break loose. Um, actually, the way you get out of that is, is basically a lot of stuff gets written off and you try to start the whole thing up again. Argentina actually had a pretty spectacular recovery after, after having that terrible collapse. So, you know, you could, but, but obviously a lot gets hurt. Um, I do, I don't want to think that through. I mean, I, I always say, you know, people do sell uh, credit default swaps against the United States. And I, I just wonder what what they're thinking, uh, what the people who buy those are thinking, because in a world in which the U.S. government defaults, what makes you think any contracts anywhere will be enforced, right? That's a, that, that's a Mad Max world, but, uh, uh, but still. Um, 
That, that's, that's the worst scenario. Um, okay, one more. Uh, wait, back. Can we... Uh, Um, having heard all your three lectures and, and having read what you've written about our own Prime Minister, um, what would you, you it, it, presumably you would support in the debate that's been ongoing, particularly two months ago between the Treasury and Downing Street over a additional fiscal stimulus, and you'll be aware of the tensions that yeah. have arisen in that debate. Uh, would you believe that the, the Prime Minister was right, that an additional stimulus could in fact, would in fact be, uh, could in fact be financed uh, without us um, getting our rating, our credit rating in, in difficulties and uh, that we could actually get the necessary borrowing? Well, the credit rating agencies, there is a problem, how do you do, do you, uh how do you predict what the credit rating agencies are going to do? And I mean, S and P has, you know, put the UK on warning, which I think is is totally bizarre. But but uh, but they did do it. Um, um, but my my by the numbers, UK should be able to do this. There, there's really uh, two things to say here. One is that um, even a fairly hefty short-term stimulus doesn't make that much difference to your long-term debt position. So I can't do the UK numbers off the top of my head, but I can do the US numbers. You know, we, the Obama stimulus, it's $800 billion. Sounds like a lot of money. Substantial part of that will actually come back in the form of higher revenues. Not, this is not a Keynesian version of the Laffer curve. It's just sort of you know, straightforward to the extent that it stimulates the economy, some of it comes back. The net debt cost of the Obama stimulus is surely under $500 billion. And okay, 500 billion here, 500 billion there, and soon you're talking about real money. But the, uh, um, but in fact, for the United States, 500 billion more or less in debt is not going to make any difference at all. And if we do a second stimulus, say another 500 billion, that'll be another 250, 300 billion dollars in debt. That's not going to make a big difference. Uh, the the what will have to happen? Britain clearly is on an unsustainable long-run fiscal course, and and stuff is going to have to happen a few years out. Uh, cuts in spending, higher revenues, which to some extent is locked in. But I actually, so can I judge the psychology of markets and the psychology of the rating agencies? I'm a little worried, but by the economics, um, Britain ought to have been able to and should have been more aggressive about stimulus than it's been. Uh, the, the, the underlying math of Britain's fiscal situation doesn't look very different from the US, and the US definitely uh, has room for and, and need of a second uh, stimulus package. So, you know, if, if um, I, easy for me to say, right? I'm not, I'm not sitting there in, in, uh, in the hot seat at, in, in any government, but, but I, I do have the feeling that Britain allowed itself to be bullied by, uh, by the bond market vigilantes more than was necessary. And I believe that's my last answer. Thank you all. <laughs>